Good evening. This uh, lecture, Leilu Nishmat Mazal Bat Esther and Leora Bat Esther, and Leatzlachat uh, Boris Shimonov and his family, Atzlacha, Refua, Briut, Kol Tuv. Also, Mori Nisim Ben uh, Eti Esther, Refua Shlema, David Ben Turan, Tova, Atzlacha, Bebet Adin. לרפואת שען אז דבורה אל שבע בת שרה, אל אלוהי נשמת אברהם בן אפרים. One announcement, next Monday there's no lecture here. Please uh, make a note. Tomorrow I'll be בעזרת השם in Brooklyn as usual, and next week also Brooklyn as usual on Tuesday. But next Monday no, no lecture. Baruch Hashem, we finished Purim in Yerushalayim, they had Purim today, we had it yesterday. Yerushalayim is, the, is different than the rest of Israel. Uh, it's one day after. Today for us was uh, some remain, you know, remain of Purim, it's called Shushan Purim. We didn't do confessions in a tefillah today. It's also partially like a Yom Tov, partially. Uh, Benji, just check the channel. Is it working? Okay. Tov. Uh, so, Baruch Hashem, a lot of people I saw this year, they got the point of the importance of giving tzedakah in Purim. It was important that people actually gave matanot laivionim more than previous years. You know, so... As much as Baruch Hashem, there was a better uh, reaction, there's still some people that needed help, there was not enough money to help them. But to be honest, I was expected it to be a lot worse. So for me, it was kind of a relief that we were able to help 70, 80% of the people who needed. Now we're coming towards Pesach. Pesach is an expensive holiday. Many families will not have enough to buy matzot, wine, meat, all these things that they need for the Chag, the ladies, the Maror. So those, Baruch Hashem, who Hashem blessed them with wealth, cannot be selfish, cannot be egoistic. They have to look around for people that they know and make sure that the other people will also have enough to have a respectable holiday. Thinking only about yourself, when there are people around you that you know that they're having hard time, creates a serious problem for you. Not just for, they have a problem, but for you it creates a problem, why? Because like Kadosh Baruch Hu says, you could have helped others, two or three other families around you to have a better Yom Tov. You, could, you should have done it. And Pesach, especially when on Pesach, you know, we say in Agada, Kol ditzrich yetev yifzach. We say everyone who, need, who is needed is welcome to come in, even if we don't know you. The door is open. So to give an announcement like this in Agada, and then you keep yourself tight without helping anyone, without inviting poor people to your Pesach table, what good is that? You're making an announcement which you're not good for it. So, as you know, on Shabbat, we read Parashat Zachor. We read Parashat Vaikra. We started the book of Leviticus, Vaikra. And in the end, the last Aliyah, after we finished the first seven Aliyot, we have Maftir. We took out the second Sefer Torah, and we read in the end, the end of Parashat Ki Tetze. Ki Tetze La Milchama, it's in Deuteronomy. Why we read the last paragraph of the of Kitetze? Because it's mitzvah just before Purim, we have Parashat Zachor, meaning the Torah commands every Jew to remember what the nation of Amalek Imach Shimam did throughout history to the Jewish nation. That's why this this part of reading, usually every year, every Shabbat when we read, it's rabbinical. Moshe Rabbeinu made a takana that we should read in the Torah. So we read in the Torah Monday, Thursday, and Shabbat, three times a week. The actual reading 
It's a rabbinical mitzvah. So that's an, in general. Except this time when we read Parashat Zachor, it's just, it's obligation from the Torah. Why? Because we have a mitzvah. One of the six hundred and thirteen commandments is to remember what this horrible nation of Amalek, which they are the real devil of the world. They have to remember what they did to us in history, how they attacked us when we came out of Mitzrayim and all the other problems we had with them. Haman is also Amalek. The whole story of Purim is because of them. <coughs> Who is Amalek in the, in the Torah? The grandson of Esav. Yaakov had a son, Esav. Esav, Esav has a son, Eliphaz. This Eliphaz had a son, Amalek. So Amalek came from Esav, Esav of Edom. The Germans, the Nazis, Haman, a lot of the Russians, French, Germans of today, they're all children of Amalek, of this Esav, Edom. The Gemara says in Masechet Megillah, Zo Germania Shel Edom. This is Germany of Edom. This was 2,000 years ago when there was really actually no, no nation in the world named Germany. It's already written in the Talmud that the children of Esav will be called Germany. And there will be 300 tribes, 300 tribes, barbarian tribes, which together will form this nation of Germany. It's written in Masechet Megillah. So, we have, I, I decided that in the beginning, I will uh, speak a few minutes about this mitzvah of Zachor et Asher Aser Asalecha Amalek. We have to understand, in the Torah, there are two kinds of uh, cursed nation. This the seven nations that live lived in the land of Canaan when the Jewish people came from Egypt to enter Israel. The, there were seven nations over there that Hashem warned us not to make peace with them, not to have mercy on them, and to destroy their idols, and to make them either surrender and become righteous Gentiles and keep the seven laws of Noah, or if they don't want, they have to run out of Israel. And if they refuse to run out of Israel and they want to start a war, you have to kill them. They should not have any mercy on them. You first give them an option to repent. If they repent, you leave them alone. You don't kick them out. They stay there in the land of Israel and they, they are not allowed to commit sins in public. And they're not allowed to have idols as they used to. If they agree, you leave them alone. If they disagree, you give them an option to run out. If they still don't want, they want to stay and fight, you go into a war with them and you kill them. You have no mercy on them. Why? Because these are nations that God hates very much. Why he hates them? Because they are idol worshippers. Remember, the sin of being an idol worshipper is a very, very big crime. Once a person worship a different God but Hashem, immediately he goes to the worst list of the people that God hates the most in the world. There's a list of people that God hates. It says clearly that he hates them. Who are they? Idol worshippers, we just say. People that influence the public to be wicked, meaning they put idols or they make people believe in, in fake religion, or they make people secular. All these lefty liberals, who fight the religion and try to destroy the holiness of the, the Holy Land, those are considered Mahtiye Arabim. Like when you hear that some rabbi calls himself a rabbi from uh, Florida, he's inviting a Christian missionary into his synagogue to speak to the community. Then you, you know this is Mahtiye Arabim, but the worst kind that brings an idol worshiper, a missionary, into the holy synagogue next to the Sefer Torah, this field gonna stand and preach about JC, his God, his fake God. To let someone like that into the synagogue, that's already a huge crime. To let him speak to the community, multiply the crime by a thousand. Just imagine that one Jew over there will stay in touch with that missionary after that. 
and he will invite him to their parties in a church, or he will offer him financial help because they have billions of dollars, all these idol worshippers. They raise tons of money. And that's it. This person and his children and grandchildren will all be idol worshippers thanks to that fake rabbi. You understand? And you see his face in magazines. You see his face in kosher orthodox uh, organization. They don't know. They don't know what they're doing. They just see anyone and they put him in. They don't check, they don't investigate the damage that will be to present such a Mahdi Arabim, to put him in their videos or to put them in their magazines. They call themselves religious or yeshiva. They have all these names. The last thing they are is yeshiva. Let's put it that way. They are considered Mahdi Arabim. One other group of people that Hashem cannot stand are people that are arrogant and proud. They have big ego. People that have gava, to avat Hashem kol gvalev. The Gemara brings four groups of people that cannot accept the Shekhinah, the, the spirit of Hashem, cannot be in the same place. Meaning when Hashem comes with His holiness, they won't be able to accept that. Arba katot ena mekablot ne Shekhinah. Clowns. People that everything by them is not serious. Jokes, making jokes about everything. People who try to become more religious, they make fun. Those kind of people, you have plenty of them everywhere you go. I'm sure you have some relatives like that. Sometimes it's your own parents, sometimes it's your brother, sometimes it's the neighbor. They come to your Shabbat table and ruin the atmosphere. Those call kat leitzanim, leitzim. Then you have kiss up. People that kiss up to the wicked people. Praise Michalele Shabbat. Praise all kinds of fake speakers who actually destroys the Torah. They praise them. They give them the stage. They publish their speeches. They call kisap, chanfanim, kat chanfanim, enam ekablim pne shechina. Then another group, people that speak Lashon Hara. They have to make other people's reputation get ruined. Even though when it comes to speak Lashon Hara, many people don't know that sometimes it's mitzvah to speak Lashon Hara. Depend who you speak about. When you speak about one of these fakers from my blacklist, you have to warn the people. So the more you warn from them, the better it is. If someone is Mechalel Shabbat, declare a war against Hashem and against his covenant with the Jewish nation, which is Shabbat, Hafez Chaim clearly writes, Hafez Chaim was the number one expert in the laws of Lashon Hara. His book is our guidelines. When we want to know about, about Lashon Hara or about Motsi Shemra, who you're allowed to talk, who you're not allowed to talk, that's the source, Hafez Chaim. Hafez Chaim writes over there that those who are Mechalelei Shabbat Befaresia, you're allowed to talk Lashon Hara about them. They're not considered a part of the Jewish nation. Since they're not considered a part of the Jewish nation, they're not considered your brother. And the Torah says, Lo telech rachil be'amecha. You're not allowed to speak gossip about anyone from your own nation. Meaning, if you speak about some idol worshiper from a different nation, you did not commit a sin. The best recommendation is not to talk Lashon Hara, even about people that you're allowed to, because there is a habit by people that once they begin to do something, they are used to it. And once they start speaking about the wicked people, it's just a matter of time until they will start speaking about other people that are righteous that are not allowed to talk about. Right? And the fourth group is Kat Shakranim, people that speak lies all the time. But not just speak lies. Their entire mentality is all lies. They are fake people. They give fake smiles. They praise the wrong people. They double face. They say one thing in your face, and right when you turn around, they say some opposite about you. These are the people that are all fakers. Usually, you find a lot of politicians like that. One minute they're with you, the next minute they stick a knife in your back, just like Biden and his friends. Well, in the beginning of the war, oh, we support Israel, Israel must defeat the Hamas, Israel must destroy the Hamas, it's not negotiable, all hostages have to be released. And what did they do today? They vote today 
with the rest of the United Nations, they allow them to pass a resolution today that Israel has to cease fire, to stop right away the attack <laughs> against this monster, when half of the job wasn't done yet. It still have 20,000 terrorists with guns, with uh, RPGs, still walking there. I mean, we didn't even get to half of the job. Ah, so the world lost their patience. Six months of war, and the Israelis are not progressing. Oh, yeah, they're right. It's a, it's a weak army. It's not what it used to be. The army is weak. The army is weak, and it runs by terrible lefty generals who destroys the army. Each soldier by itself, many of them are lions. They could have done a lot better, but they have to fight with handcuffs. Good luck. They don't let them do anything. Every little thing is uh, legally and allowed, not allowed. You're allowed to shoot, you're not allowed to shoot. No, we have to first check inside, you know, with the, with the rest lefty garbage that you, you see everywhere. They don't let them do the job. That's why it took so long. If they would fight like the Russians fight, like the Americans fight when they go to Afghanistan, they care about the rules, they wipe out everyone. They don't care, citizens, civilians, they don't care. They're just double-faced, they're hypocrite. They kill everyone, Taliban, everybody. They don't care, women, children, they bomb the whole area. They don't, they're not gonna send soldiers to look in the hallway if some terrorist is hiding there or not. They knock down building after building, massive amount of attacks. But with Israel, they say, no, you have to go and check room by room. Maybe there's some woman there. Maybe a civilian who's sleeping, snoring. You, you disturb his sleep. That's why it took so long. That's why half of the job wasn't done. And now the world is tired. They're tired of war and again and again. Enough with this. Even Trump say, you have to finish it already. What? We need peace. Peace with whom? With Nazis? With monsters that the only reason they live is to kill Jews? What kind of peace are you talking about? This is a dreamer. It's also faker. With all his love for Israel, and I'm the best president for the Jews. But that's a faker. The fact that he comes two days ago and say, you should finish the war already. Enough, we, we need peace. Peace with whom? You're talking to the world, there's nobody to talk to about peace here. Countries can reach agreements and that's it. You know, you don't deal with normal people, you deal with monsters, with murderers. So that's called kachakranim. Almost all politicians are shakranim. Almost all of them are fakers. All, 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 all of them are liars. All of them are double-faced. Echad bapeh, echad balev. And those are the one who cannot be together with Hashem. So there are four groups and Hashem cannot stand. Now let's talk a little bit about Amalek. As I explained, the roots of Amalek is from Esav. Amalek came to attack the Jewish nation when they came out of Egypt. What was so urgent? You are in the middle of nowhere and you come far from so far, days, days with the horses to meet the Jews just when they come out of Egypt going towards Israel. Usually when uh, two countries are fighting, it's about property, about the border. You stole their water, you stole their oil, illegal immigration, something between two neighbor nations that creates a fight. We have nothing to do with them. We are here and they are there. We, have, we don't have a border with them. We are in our place and they are in their place. Why they bother to come from far away to attack us? Because that goes to the root of the problem. What's the root of the problem? The day that Jacob bought the Olam Abba of Esav, bought the Bechora by giving him this lentil soup, the hatred that Esav will have to the children of Yaakov will remain until the end of days. And uh, obviously, Esav said to his son, Eliphaz, you have to go and kill Yaakov. Why? For what he's done to me. So Eliphaz was a student of Yaakov. Yaakov was teaching him Torah, it's his nephew. When he came to Yaakov, Yaakov said to him, you want to kill your rabbi? So what can I do? My rabbi is a good man. My father tell me to kill my rabbi. What should I do? He said to him, I have a solution for you. Take everything I have, clean me out. 
Once you make me very poor, it's count like you killed me. Plus, go back to your father and tell him that if you will kill me, you and your children will have to go to Egypt and be slaves there. Because somebody from the family of Abraham must go to Egypt. So if you keep me alive, it's me and my children that will go there. If you kill me now, it's going to be your father and his children. Do you want to go and be 400 years slaves in, in Egypt, like Hashem said to Abraham? He went back to Esau and said, well, good point. As much as I hate him, I also love myself. I don't want to be slave. My grandfather Abraham, Hashem actually told him that his children must be slaves. <laughs> and if I'll kill Yaakov, it's going to be me. He's right. So what should we do? I am ordering you that the moment they finish their slavery, make sure, you, if, not, if it's not you, it's your children. If it's not your children, your grandchildren. Pass it from father to son. That when the children of Yaakov come out of Egypt, you must go and attack them. To pay them back for what their grandfather Yaakov did to me, Esav. This is the root of the problem. For that, you had the Holocaust. For that, you have the story of a man almost in Holocaust in the time of a man. For that, you have so many anti-Semites all over the world, all kinds of swastika everywhere, all these Nazis everywhere. And half of the goyim in the world are very, very anti-Semite. At least half. Half, there's no, no doubt about. The other half, you can argue, but there's no question that there is at least half that are allergic to everything that smells like Judaism. What is it? These are the chain reaction of the beginning of the hatred of Yaakov and Esav before they even were born. Already in their mother womb, they already started by Tretzetsuanarim Bekirba. The war already started in Rivka's stomach. And it's continuing as we speak every second, almost all over the world. Now we're going to learn something that you probably never heard before. And many people that actually have intention to keep this mitzvah of Zachoret Asher Asar 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 Amalek, but they don't really know who Amalek is. And we're going to understand once for all what does it mean when we say the word Amalek, what do we really mean? The question we have to ask in today's generation, today's generation, do we have an obligation to hate Amalek? Can we locate Amalek in the world? We don't know for sure who is Amalek. Why? Technically, they are gone from the world. There's no nation named Amalek today. Just like you don't have Ashur, just like you don't have Moab, just like you don't have Canaan, Amorites, all these nations that are mentioned in the Torah, one by one are gone, even the Romans. You have some Italians in Italy. No guarantee they are the children of Titus and his friends. No guarantee. You have the Greeks in Athens today. There's no guarantee that they have any connection to Antiochus to the Greek Empire. There's no guarantee. The Arabs in all the Middle East, not all Arabs have a lineage to Ishmael. Some do, some don't. It's hard to know. You cannot say this Ahmed for sure is a grandson of Ishmael. You don't know for sure. The reason you don't know is because there was a king. His name was Sancheriv. He made wars in a war in the world and people were so afraid of him that everybody packed his stuff and started to run to all over. So the nations were all on the move in the time of his kingdom. Everyone ran and got mixed. All the nations started to get mixed with each other. They ran to here and to there and they came from there. As he was attacking areas, similar to what ISIS are doing now in certain places, people are running. These people, for instance, that ran from certain parts of Syria, when ISIS took over, they ran, some of them to Lebanon, some of them ran to Jordan, some of them ran to maybe Iraq, some of them ran to America. 
and all get mixed with other nations. After two, three generations, you don't remember that this grandfather of this American kid was a Syrian refugee who ran away from Syria 70 years ago. Nobody remembers that. This is, it looks like a regular American kid in New York. You don't know from what uh, genealogy is coming. Now, today, after more than 2,000 years that all the nations got mixed with each other, you do not know who belongs to the seven cursed nations. You do not know who is for sure Amalek. And you don't even know for sure who is an Arab, who is a real original Ishmael. You don't know. It's all got mixed. So if that's the case, there is really no mitzvah of erasing the memory of Amalek anymore, because where are they? There's no Amalek. The answer is wrong. There is Amalek, and he's very active, and he continues to make problems for us every day of our life. The Rambam, almost 900 years ago, the Rambam writes that is mitzvah from the Torah to hate them to the highest level of hatred. Just think about it. When you hear the word Hitler, it fills you up with rage. Especially if your family got killed in the Holocaust, then it's even a personal thing, not just a, a national thing. It's a personal thing. Someone knows that his grandparents and his uncles and who knows how many are all, they're all murdered. And he left with one or two survivors from his family from Germany or Poland. That's even more personal. So the, this hatred remains a, 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 a every day's thing. When he looks and he has no family, no relatives, no cousins, no nobody in the world. So the, there's no way to ever forget what they did to you, these Nazis. Other people, they remember it in memorial times or when they come, when they come up with the articles about the Holocaust or movies about it or the Holocaust Day or when they, when they go to a museum or when there's other things that happens in the world, right away they bring up the Nazis. So from time to time you remember about these horrible monsters named Nazis. But other than that, you don't think about it every day. But when it comes to Amalek, it's mitzvah from the Torah, meaning God ordered us to hate them to the highest level of hatred. So here, first of all, we learn that some people it's mitzvah to love them, and some people it's mitzvah to hate them. And as much as you hate them, it counts just as a good mitzvah, like when you love someone. If you love the big tzaddik, you love uh, Rav Kuk, you love Rav Ades, you love big tzaddikim. Why you love him so much? Because he's a great servant of Hashem. Because he's a great teacher. Because he teaches Torah. Because he makes uh, influence about, uh, on a lot of people to come closer to Hashem. Because he writes great books. You know, why do you love him? Because he helps so many miserable people in the community. He runs the shul because he made such a great yeshiva for us to learn. There are reasons why you love him. Mainly the reasons are because he's a servant of Hashem. So just as it is mitzvah to love this tzaddik, there's mitzvah to hate the rasha. But when it comes to Amalek, it doesn't matter what kind of a person he is. Nice, not nice, polite, arrogant, a murderer. Right now he's not a murderer, he's a regular citizen. It doesn't really matter. If you knew for sure that this person is from the nation of Amalek, immediately you must work on yourself to hate him to the highest level. If you knew for sure, today there's no way to know, but if you knew for sure, like back in the time, that this person belongs to the nation of Amalek, the Torah said that he cannot leave him alive a second. He cannot let him live. And this is written in the book of God that Christians and Muslims translated to their own language and adapted all the names and the principles, many of the things from the Torah, it's in their religion. So they cannot pick and choose. You cannot come and say, I'm a devoted Muslim. We don't eat pork because it's written in the Torah not to eat pork. We don't charge interest from each other because God hates interest. We are women dress modest because God hates lack of modesty. 
We uh, have uh, mercy on the poor, we help the poor in the, in the communities. Why? Because it's written in the Torah to help the poor. So they come, they choose a lot of nice things from the Torah. They adapt it to their religion. Then they're going to say, oh, what is this? Mitzvah to kill a malek? Just like that, to kill them? Yeah, the same God say it. The same God say that you have to love the righteous. He say you have to hate the wicked. The same God say that if you know, if you see a malek, you cannot leave them alive. Today we don't have it. It's not in effect. There's no way to know who is a malek. But a malek is not just a biological problem. A malek is an ideology problem. There are people today that they are the Amalek of today, and I'm going to prove it to you. So let's continue. So the Ramban say it's about to hate them. Bimlo tokef asina, 100% of hatred, not 90%. It's not enough. The highest level of hatred. Just like when the time when they attacked us, when we came out of slavery, and right away they came to kill us. The same hatred we had to them back then, we have to have to them today, after 3,335 years. We still have to hate them, and this hatred, there's no permission to lower even 1% of it, the Rambam writes. ולא תכלה שנאתו ותחסר מן הנפשות עם אורך הזמן. There's no permission to forget, forget the hatred over the years and make it weaker and weaker. If over the generations the hatred towards this name, Amalek, will be lower, we violating the rules of the Torah. Just like eating chazir, just like eating pork. Just like breaking Shabbat. How many people know that? Almost no one. Once a year, once a year, I remember to hate Amalek. In Parashat Zachor, Zachor et Asher Asalcha Amalek. The rest of the year, I don't think about them. That's the mistake. You have to think about them every day and every hour. And I'm going to prove it to you soon. Lichora, allegedly, it's a little bit hard to understand the language of the Rambam. How can you keep this mitzvah today exactly as Hashem commanded back in time, when it was an actual mitzvah, when you actually saw them coming to kill you, these Nazis? How can today you, you elevate yourself to such level of hatred like we used to have back in time? We have to understand, how can it be? The reason that we have such a dilemma and such a question is because we don't understand the obligation correctly. If we understood what Hashem meant when He said, remember what Amalek did to you and the mitzvah to hate them, if we would understand the root of it, we, we would not have this question. This, this wondering that we have, how can it be? It's because we never understood the actual order, the command. Because Amalek is still alive. They are still kicking. They are still making damage every second, just like they did 3,300 years ago. They still fight against God. They still fight against his Torah. They are the root of all the impurity in the world. All the impurity, all the wickedness of everyone in the world, they are the root of it. Communism, socialism, lefties, all the garbage in the world, all come from this word Amalek. Just like they came in the desert to fight the nation of Israel, for what? You know, you have to understand. Try to go back 3,335 years. Try to go back. The Jewish nation just had an unbelievable year. For one year, Hashem is punching the Egyptians, one strike after the other. Destroyed their Nile, the water, billions of frogs, hail that fell and killed their animals and broke everything. Grasshoppers who clean all the green from the trees. Disaster. Darkness. And then the final plague was every firstborn is dying. 
meaning millions died, or hundreds of thousands of people in one minute fell and died. It's a holocaust in Egypt. Everyone screamed, everyone cried. There is no house, the Torah say, without screaming and crying. The Torah said that in some houses there were more than one kid falling and dying. A man and a woman, all of a sudden two or three dying. You know, how, how can it be? It's supposed to be every firstborn. Why my second and my third also died? Because she cheated on him. The kids belong to different men. There's no DNA back in time. So he doesn't know. He thinks the first one is mine, the second and the third. But in reality, each one, the first one was from him, the second and the third belongs to two different fathers. So they are firstborn to that man. But he doesn't know it. All of a sudden, three are dying in one house, or two. It destroyed them mentally also, not just physically. After what God did to the Egyptians, the whole world was shaking. As Rahab said to the spies, when Joshua and Joshua, they, they sent spies to, to Israel before they occupied the land, she said to the spies, all of us are shaking here from fear, from what your God did to you in Egypt, in the exodus of Egypt. We all heard it. We know exactly what happened. We are dying here from fear. I'm going to hide you. I'm going to protect you from the army here. But please promise me, swear to me that when you come here, you don't kill me and you don't kill my family. And they told her, yes, just tie the sheets from the window all the way down to the, to the street. And the soldiers, the Israelis that comes, they will know when they see a window with sheets coming from that uh, house, they won't touch that house. Then she converted and she became the wife of Yoshua ben Nun. But everyone, it's written in the book of Joshua that all the goyim in the Middle East, everybody knew what God did to the Egyptians. That's why they were all shaking, except Amalek. Amalek, when he sees that God now is in the highest level of connection with his children, that he performed great miracles for them, that's the last timing the worst timing that you want to come and start a war with them. He will wipe you out just like he did to the Egyptians. Who do you think you are? Are you any better than the Egyptians? If God destroyed them, why wouldn't they destroy you? Wait 10, 20 years. Let them commit some sins. Let them get God angry. You'll find the time to attack them. When that's when God would want them to be punished, he would let you succeed. But right now, this is the greatest connection that they have with their God. Now you come to attack them, right? This is Amalek. Yes, we know we're going to lose. We know we're going to die. But the, the goal of killing the Jews is so important to us that it's worth any price that we were going to pay. Exactly like the Palestinian Nazis. Exactly like what happened in October. You destroyed Gaza, kill all of us. Kill all our women, kill our children, kill everybody. We already know that that's what's gonna be. I mean, no one would sit and clap when you kill 1,500 civilians, right? They know what's coming, but they don't care. No matter how much we're going to suffer, 100 years, in hell, worth it to kill one Jew. Same concept of Amalek. So Rabotai, so they see that the Jews are coming out of Egypt, they rush immediately. Why they rush? To make the Jews lose their faith in God, even partially. How the Jews would lose their faith? It looks very bad. If I just took you out of Egypt, I just opened the Red Sea for you. The Egyptian drowns. You finally feel free. I just told you I'm going to give you the Torah. And who shows up? Another war. So the Jews will say, come on. How much more are we going to suffer? We just finished over 80 years of, of slavery. Finally, you took us out of Egypt. And again, you sent another nation to attack us. It will make them very weak in the Emunah. Just like when I speak to people on a daily basis, many people have the same claim. What's their claim? I have too many problems. I, uh, my emunah is not what it used to be. 
ah, I'm not, I'm not the man you used to know, Rabbi. Why? Things happen. I never got married. I got married, but I don't have children. I had a business, I lost it. I have this, I have that. Uh, all kinds of excuses. Technically, the more problems a person has in life, the more he has to run to Hashem for mercy. But in reality, many people, they're only willing to be connected with Hashem when everything works out for them. When problems begin, one problem after the other, the more they suffer, the more they kick the religion. And that's the trick of the Satan, to make a person weak in his emunah. I can't take this anymore. I, I give up. God hates me. How many times you hear people say, oh, God hates me. Come on, Rabbi, this happened to me, and then this, and then that, and then uh, they have a whole list. Wow, it sounds like a Turkish movie. One tragedy after the other. In the end, sometimes people like to exaggerate. Something little happened, they make a big deal out of it. Like in Israel, they say, Ose mizvuv pil. You have a little uh, fly, and you describe him like he's an elephant, meaning you have a little problem, <laughs> and you made the problem a thousand times bigger than what it really was. So, Rabotai, Amalek say, look, their God will kill us. We take it to consideration. We, do, we know it, we're going to die. We, we die. But we will instigate between them and their God. We will make them weak in the religion. It's worth it for us. Let's go and see what happened. The, the concept of Amalek is le carer et roshem anisim. The miracles that made a huge impact on you, they come right away to ruin the impact. In every generation and generation, the obligation to hate Amalek is not what you think to hate the Amalek of 3,335 years ago. No, no, no. It's to hate the Amalek today. Who is the Amalek today? Bernie Sanders, Chuck Schumer, Bennett, Lieberman, and the rest of the garbage out there. They are the Amalek today. Amalek is a concept. It's not just the genealogy. It's the concept. It's the concept that you have so many wicked people in the world, Jews and non-Jews, come from any nation. People that always gonna do everything they can to make you step back from the religion. It could be scientists, it could be professors in college, it can be many different teachers, reporters in a newspaper, reporters on the news, all kinds of uh, directors in Hollywood that make all kinds of heresy, heresy films, and even speakers that consider themselves as rabbi and they teach and they post their lectures online and they destroyed you with their heresy. And they make so many people who wants to be religious become idol worshippers. Or make many people who wants to come closer to Hashem, they make them con con totally confused in the principles of the religion, in the right ideology. They get so confused that in the end they lose everything. And that's called Amalek. So the concept of hating Amalek today is exactly like it was a thousand years ago and three thousand years ago. The Amalek is still everywhere you go. You don't have a day in your life without meeting them. You meet them on the news. You meet them even when they say the weather. You meet them on the Discovery Channel when they describe to you how the world is billions of years old. You meet them in politics. You meet them as leaders of, of, of countries. You meet them as terrorists. You meet them everywhere you go. The entire world is full of them. That's the concept of hating Amalek. Because Amalek is the enemy of God. And because he's the enemy of God, he always will attack God's children. That's why they don't attack other nations. They always come to attack only the children of God. And that's what they do. And who are the Amalek? A Kofrim, the heretics, the infidels that fight against Hashem. They are 
continuing the legacy of Amalek and the hatred to them must be in the highest possible level. How do we learn it? It's written in Exodus 17, verse 16. Milchama, a war, Leashem, to God, Baamalek, Midor, Dor. There's a war between God and Amalek in every generation. What do you mean in every generation? They are gone already from the time of Sancheriv, more than 2,000 years. From here you see that they are not gone and they are all over. And the war with them will never end until the arrival of the Messiah. Milchama Hashem ba'amalek midor dor. It means if the Torah told you that this war will remain in every generation and generation, it means that they will be around. And who are they? The heretics, the kufrim, alochamim b'milchemet במלחמת בהשם ובתורתו, מלחמה בהשם ובתורתו. Let's go a little bit deeper to explain more. The war against Amalek is different than any other war you heard about or you know about. It's a completely different concept. As it's written in the end of Parashat Ki Tetze, just what we read on Shabbat, זכור את אשר עשה לך עמלק בדרך. Remember what Amalek did to you on the way. Who cares where? What does who care? On the way, in the city, in the land, on the moon. Who cares where? Amalek comes to kill us. What difference does it make if we are here or here or there? No, there is a concept to the word בדרך. אשר קרחה בדרך. What happened to you on your way? All the commentaries, they all explain that the concept of Amalek is to attack someone that is on his journey, on his path, on his way. They are different than all other wars. All other wars have a reason why they fight. They want land, they want money, they want oil. They just hate the other nation, so they start a war with them. It could be revenge, you did this to us, so we will do this to you, top. But it definitely has some kind of a physical reason. They have no physical reason. We don't have anything together with you. We never took from you, we don't live next to you. If you never come to attack us, you will never see us. It's 100% a spiritual war. So, Rabotai, when the Jewish nation is walking in the middle of the desert and they don't have a land of their own, what would Amalek gain by attacking them? Will they get a land? No. Will they get oil? No. What will they get? Besides killing people, women and children, what will they get? The answer, they will make you weak in your religion. That's all. Amalek? Kofrim ba'emuna, they are heretic, infidel against faith in God. They are kofrim in ashgachat Hashem al buav. They don't accept the concept that Hashem runs the show, that Hashem is in charge in every detail. They fight to cut off the name of God from this world. They want to spread communism and heresy and all kinds of things that unfortunately they did everywhere you go. Therefore, when Hashem proved to the whole world in the exodus of Egypt how he runs the show and nothing can happen without him and it became so obvious to everyone, Shamu Amim Irgazun, Chil Achaz Yoshve Pelashet, it's written in the Torah, all the nation hurts and they were shaking from fear. They were restless, and the people of Pleshet, the Philistines, that sits in the area of Gaza back in time, they were shaking from fear. Chil, Chil means fear. Achaz Yosher Pleshet. 
The people of Plashet know the Jews are on the way to this land. This is the end of us. Right away Amalek came from very, very far. They troubled themselves to come and to attack only to cool, to cool the people from their devotion and hot faith in Hashem. To cool you. So the concept of hating them and fighting them and destroying them, it's not, the concept is not to take an Amalek, Nazi, and kill him. The concept is what's behind it, to kill the ideology of this Rishayim. What does it mean, Asher Karcha Baderech? Karcha Milashon Kar. Kar means cold, he's cooling you. Look how hot you are. What is it like? A person went on a date with a, gr a great girl. Ten times they went on a day, perfect, wow. It's, it's full of fire and, uh, and feelings, butterflies in his heart. Then come a jealous friend of him and begin to cool him off. Ah, you didn't see? She's too heavy, she's too short, she has this, her family is a disaster. I checked once, she was here, she was there. Five years ago she had uh, something in school. Slowly, slowly, he speaks bad about this girl until this guy, after a week, everyone asks him, what happened? You were so enthusiastic. What happened? You're not so interested for the next date. That's Amalek. That's what Amalek does. You have a miracle, immediately come some lefty scientist and say, oh, that happens, you know, sometimes it's because of the galaxies, the this and that. <laughs> that creates a, a storm in the ocean. It's hard to believe, but it does affect a lot of people. It does affect a lot of people. So, Rabotai, listen to this. Asher karcha lashon mikre also, not just kor, kor means cold, coldness. Karcha means mikre, you know these people that everything that happened, how do you know it's from God? Coincidence, things happen. It happens once in a blue moon, it happens, and now it did. Right away, they put a doubt. Amalek means safek. Amalek means safek. It's the same numeric value. Amalek is 240, Safek. A doubt is also 240. By the way, there is another thing that is 240. You know what? Dollar. Money. Money is also Amalek. Once you have a lot of money, you don't need God so much. That's how people think. Ah, I'm okay, I have investment. I have this, and I have that store, and I have this building, and another building. What can go wrong? Ma, Hashem is going to take my 50 different businesses in one shot and left me with nothing? It's not realistic. I lose this, I have that. I lost that, I have another one, and another one. You need a lot of effort to take away all my investment. In 2008, there, are, there were people that had so many buildings, and they lost all of them in one week. All of it. I know people here in real estate in Queens. I saw it coming, so I told my friend, I told him, make sure you sell every one of your positions. Best case scenario, I have one property at a time. So why? So make sure you don't have like 10 homes that you're renovating. You take loans, you pay interest, you're gonna crash and have real estate will go down 30, 40%. It won't worth it for you to finish the renovation. You lose everything. And one of my friends, he listens. He really kept only one. And he survived. His bosses, people he used to work for, people who used to have big offices. The bank took away everything. Why? Well, it wasn't worth it for them to fix. I know one billionaire. He bought a property in Las Vegas for $600 million. They built the, the frame of the building, all cement. They gave it to the bank. It, it was not worth it for them to finish the construction. So you know what happened? They had bathrooms, toilet there, but there was no pipes yet. 
the pipes were not connected to the sewer. So all the homeless and all the animals that live on the streets of Las Vegas, they all moved into the not finished building and there's no water. And they used the toilet and rats started to come and even the bank didn't want it. You had to knock down the whole building. I mean, it was a disaster. They all come, all the, the junkies, all the drug addicts. The worst kind of people came to those place. A few years later, the property is back to be fortunate. But they already lost it. So the idea, you know, if Hashem wants, in one week, it's all gone. It's all gone. Banks, banks that used to be tens of billions of dollars. In one week, they finished. Everyone pulled out all the money and they went bankrupt. Banks! You know, there used to be Wachovia Bank. It was a great bank. They had so many locations everywhere in California. Whoop! One day, bankrupt. Wells Fargo took off. Citibank was about to go bankrupt. They got some Saudi billionaire to buy them and to save them. If not the government, you would not have one bank left in America. All of them would go bankrupt. The bank, the government saved 19 large banks, gave them money to buy the small ones. Why? Imagine now thousands of banks go bankrupt in one week. <laughs> what will they do? They were lucky that there was a religious Jew, Bernanke, at that time. He was a very smart person. He started to print billions of dollars every week and give it out. Why? If not that, people will kill each other on the street here, 2008. It was not far, not far from that. And now we are in a risk. It can happen now again. If they're not going to eventually lower the interest, how long people will be able to be frozen like this? Now everything is frozen. The markets, you know, it's not worth it to buy. It's hard to sell, hard to get a loan. It's a disaster right now. How long they will survive, I don't know. That's why I told people, make sure all your money is in a large bank. Chase, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, maybe Citibank. Don't put your money by small banks. Even if they offer you 6% interest on your money and they blinded you. Wow, 6%, it's great. 6% for one year and then you lose all your money. Oh, but it's FDIC, Rabbi. FDIC, baloney. You're not going to see a penny. They are, the government have 99 years to pay you. Maybe your grand-grandson will get 50 bucks a month. You know? It's baloney. But if the government has to pay 200 million Americans, each one of them up to 250,000, you know how much money they're going to have to pay people? They're not going to be able to do it. They tell you FDIC. By the way, FDIC used to be 100,000 until 2008. Because of what happened, people didn't want to put money in the banks. So they raised it to 250. But if you have few accounts and you put in each one of them 250, it's not guaranteed that you're going to get all your money. Because it goes on social security. I won't help you. You can have 10 accounts. Why have so many accounts? In each one, I make sure not to go over 250,000. It's not going to help you. If the bank collapse, you're going to get per social security. You, if you have your wife, she has an account, a different social security, that's it. The rest, it's all gone. Bottom line, it's in the end of Hashem. If He wants you to lose, in one minute you lose everything. It doesn't matter how many investments you have. It doesn't matter. Sometimes a person say, listen, Hashem cannot make me poor. What does Hashem do? Kill him. Hashem cannot take away your money from you? I'll take you from the money. Isn't it written clearly, Someone that made his wealth in an illegal way, deceiving, lying, stealing, forging, you know, with all kinds of tricks, he will get separated from his wealth in half of his life. That means he's supposed to live to 90 years old, Around age 45, either he would lose all his money or he would lose his life. One of the two. King Solomon wrote 3,000 years ago. It happens to a lot of people. So, Rabotai, let's just finish, conclude the, the concept of Amalek. 
So the, the, the Chazal are giving us a beautiful parable. He says, someone is boiling a bat. It's bubbling. Why? He wants later to go in and have a warm bath. Remember, they didn't have the baths that we have today. He had to heat up the water with some wood and fire. So finally, when the water now are bubbling, one person come, jump into the water, scream, ah, it's burning. So what are you doing? He said, I don't want him to enjoy a warm bath. So I came to cool it off. So, but you're suffering, you fool. It's worth it for me. I am burning right now, but knowing him that his water will be cold, it's worth it for me. This is the parable. This is the Amalekim. Those are the lefty liberals. Those are the Democrats. Those are all the filth that you see everywhere you go, all the enemies of God that they hate everything Hashem loves and they love everything he hates. Those are all Amalek. Their job in the world is to separate between you and God. That's what Chazal gave this parable. So the, the purpose of the war with Amalek, what Amalek does is to deny the leadership of God in a creation. To say that the clear miracles, it's coincidence. Oh, it happens every once in a while. It doesn't mean that it was from God. That's the laws of nature. And when people started to fear God all over the world, they wanted them to get courage back. Have nothing to be afraid. Look, we're going into a war against Israel. We're not afraid. Why should you be afraid? Learn from us. Be brave. And now they go in that they were shaking, said, well, maybe we got it all wrong. Maybe really we shouldn't be so scared. Rav Chaim Ibrisk, Zatzal, is proving from the words of the Rambam that the foundation of this mitzvah to erase Amalek is not just biologically to erase their genealogy, to erase their genes, to erase their descendants, no. It's the concept of erasing their ideology. That's really what it is about. To erase all these wicked people from the face of the earth. To destroy their ideology. To make it clear to everyone in the world to stay away from this reshaim. And he brings, when the Rambam writes in chapter 5 in the Laws of Kings, Ilchot Melachim, in the end of his book, Mishneh Torah, the last chapter is Ilchot Melachim. Perek Hey, all the laws of the kings, the fifth chapter, which halacha, the fourth one. It said the mitzvah from the Torah to ban the seven cursed nations that live in the land of Canaan. As the Torah say, that we have to go into a war with them and not to have any mercy of them until erasing their memory. And it's written by the Rambam, Vekvar avad zichram. But they were already destroyed, Baruch Hashem. There is no more Amorites, there's no more Girgashi, there's no more Knaani, there's no more Chivi, there's no more Yevusi, there's no more Lechiti. All of them are gone. Nobody knows where they are. It's Nothing left from them. So the Rambam writes, there is an obligation to hate them and to ban them and not to have mercy on them, but Baruch Hashem, the job was done for us. They're no longer here and there's no memory of them. Ask anyone in the world, tell me, do you know who the Girgashi are? Who? Ma? Nobody knows. Do you know the Yevusi? Ma? Maybe some historians will know. No one knows. Anybody ask in Europe, America, ask the Arabs. Nobody knows who you're talking about. Maybe they know the term Canaan, the land of Canaan. That's it. But they don't know. They don't know these nations because they're all erased. Because of Sanherif, that king that made wars, they, are all, they ran all over and they got mixed with the rest of the world and they are gone. So the Rambam writes, listen, Vekvar avad zichram. Their memory was erased already. Tov. 
יצרית, אז יצרית אני נגמרה עם מסכת ברכות, page 28, כשעלה סנחריב מלך אשור, סנחריב דה קינג אוף אשור, קיים And started to to mix all the nations, meaning the nations were running from one place to another. That means everyone got mixed, and you don't know who is who anymore. They all gone. So, but on the other hand, when the Rambam speaks about Amalek, this is what he writes. Vechen and also mitzvat ase. It's an obligation from the Torah to erase. The memory of Amalek and the Rambam did not write and their memory was erased. On the seven nations, the Rambam wrote, but don't worry about them anymore because their memory was erased. When right after that he say, and also mitzvah to erase the memory of Amalek, The Rambam did not try, don't worry about it, Amalek is gone from the world for the same reason. Sancheriv mixed all the nations. So if Sancheriv mixed all the nations, also Amalek is gone. No, Amalek is still around. This is the words of Rav Chaim Ibrisk. How Amalek is different than the seven nations? Sancheriv mixed the whole, the whole world. So Amalek is also... You cannot identify them. But the Amalek is not just to erase them physically. It's the concept that they are the main enemies of God in the world until the end of days. Therefore, Rav Chaim says, Muchach mize. You see from here, Shamitzvah limchot et zecher Amalek, Elon dafka limchot mishen nolad mizer Amalek. The obligation to erase the memory of Amalek, it's not to erase their, their, the children that came from the, from the seed of Amalek. No, it's the concept of erasing all the kofrim. שמחזיקים בשיטתו ודרכו של עמלק. All the heretics, all the people that makes you colder in עבודת השם. Like Santa, in one of his speeches, you're supposed to make people come close to השם, not to make them kick the religion. What does he say? The problem is when people become religious. That's where the problem begin. Religion create the problem. When people hear someone with his uh, Santa Claus beard speaking like this, people that are dumb, and unfortunately there are many dumb people out there, when they hear someone with a sombrero and a white beard saying that religion starts the problem, meaning don't be religious, it's going to create problem for you, what do you think they're going to do? Immediately run to become goyim. That's Amalek. That's exactly what Rav Chaim Ibrisk talks about. These kind of people, they are the Amalek of today. And you got to fight them. You have to fight them. There's no, you cannot say, ah, politically correct, leave it alone, this, machloket, problem, why? No, you must, if you care about Hashem, you must fight all these heretics. And Rav Chaim continue, and Rav Chaim say, שהלא שיטת עמלק עדיין קיימת אצל הכופרים הרשעים הלוחמים כנגד השם ותורתו. The war against them is still the same war, they still fight against השם in his Torah. So according to his words, we learn from the Rambam in הלכות מלכים, that when the Rambam say מצווה to erase the memory of עמלק, right? What's written over there? Mitzvat ase le'abed zecher amalek. Right? It's in the old version, it used to be mitzvah le'abed zera amalek. Zera means the children of amalek, biologically. But the, the girsa, the correct version is not to erase the genealogy, not to erase the seed of amalek is to erase the memory of Amalek. Meaning it doesn't matter if you kill the body or not. You gotta kill the shita, the ideology. You have to fight the shita until it's erased from the world. And he continues, Ikar adavar bevadai, nachon, sheyesod ha-mitzvah, 
The foundation of this obligation is לשנוא את כוח הרע של עמלק. You have to hate the evilness of Amalek. Every bad thing he does, all his energy is negative. That exists until our days, even now in our generation. It's also written in holy books, in the Masfarim Mevuarod, שעיקר כוח ההתגברות, כן, של עמלק הוא בארץ ישראל. Our sages told us and warned us that the main war against Amalek will be in the land of Israel, in the Jewish nation. In the nation of Israel, שהיא ארץ אשר השם אלוקיך דורש אותה. As it's written, this is the land of God, the land that he cares about the most. ארץ אשר השם, עיני השם אלוקיך בא מראשית השנה ועד אחרית השנה, from the beginning of the, of the year until the end of the year, my eyes, השם say, are focused on the Holy Land. That's what I care about the most, more than China and more than India and more than many, many places. Today I saw an article speaking about India. They passed a law in India that Islam is against the law. India have hundreds of millions of people. Probably more than a billion people live there. It's now became illegal to preach Islam, to build a mosque, to do anything Muslims in India. Imagine if the Europeans will do the same, or United States will do the same. In India, they can do it. Why? The, the Muslims over there don't have the power they have in the rest of the world. But here, in America and in Europe, mainly in Europe, in London, in Paris, in all these cities, there are already millions of them, and they are very violent. So if you come to them, there are five millions over there in France, and you tell them it's no longer legal to pray or to go to the mosque or to build the mosque, you cannot get a non-profit organization for Islam. You cannot collect donations. You cannot preach in the mosque every Friday like you are. And you cannot pray on the streets. And you cannot dress like a Muslim. It's against the law. Do you know what happened to, to, Paris, to France? In one day, will all be killed. They will, they will kill all the French people. The five million will kill 80 million French in one day. Therefore, it's too late for them. Should have done it when it was two, three hundred thousand. When they saw where it's going, that's what the Torah say. Chacham, ezu a chacham aroet anolad. A sign of wisdom is when you foresee the beginning of the process where it's going to end. People that are dumb, they don't see. They don't see where it's going to end. Someone that is smart, he can see ten, twenty steps ahead. This would lead to this, and this would lead to that. Someone told me today, you see how United States betray Israel in the United Nations today? So I said, very good. It's very good for us. We need United States to become our enemies. We need. If you're a believer in Hashem, that's the first thing you should pray for. Because as long as they defend us and help us and protect us and veto the votes against us, we will remain wicked forever. Forever. When we all gonna do tshuva, when we know we are alone, there's nobody besides Hashem. Until now, many Israelis put their hope in the United States. Many religious Jews now are praying that Trump will become the president. That's heresy. Heresy. Of course, it's not as bad as Sleepy Joe. There's nothing to compare. For sure it will be better for Israel, for sure it's bad for Islam and for the terrorists, it's bad for Iran. He already proved to us what his ideology is, but counting on him to help us and save us from these Ishmaelim, from the terrorists, from the United Nations and the rest of the Nazis in the world, that's heresy. We have to count only on Hashem. He does not allow us to count on anyone but him. It's rule number one in faith. If you're religious, that's rule number one. Curse be the man that trusts people. Who you trust? I trust the Rebbe. You are automatically cursed. 
What do you mean? He's a holy rebbe. Yes, he's holy. He's a big tzaddik. Yes, he's tzaddik. You count on him and not in Hashem. You are Rasha and you made him just now an idol. You became an idol worshiper. So, Abutai, we have to know. We should not hope that the United States will defend us and help us. We should only look up to Hashem. In a second, Hashem can do whatever he wants. I'll give you one example. Israel was doing very bad financially. Out of nowhere, we found four wells of gas, natural gas, in Israel. After 60 years, we didn't find anything. Now, one drop of oil, not gas, no nothing. All of a sudden, in one year, four different places, we make billions of dollars every month from those wells. Hard to believe. All of a sudden, Russia and Ukraine going into a war. So the world is not buying gas from Russia anymore. Who are they buying? From Israel. It's all from Hashem. Once in one week, everything turns around. Saudi, Kuwait, Abu Dhabi, uh, Bahrain, all these very wealthy, the Emirates, give them 20 years, they're all going to be broke. Nothing will be left by them. You know why? Trump was a president. Trump decided that we, we cannot be depending on the Arab oil forever. We have to develop a new technology. What they call it? Oil shell. Oil shell. What does it mean? From rocks. From the rocks, they are able to produce energy. What did the Saudi do when they saw that the Americans starting to invest billions of dollars into this technology? They lowered the price of the barrel of oil to $10 a barrel. Now you have to know, in Saudi, if the barrel of oil is less than $50, they lose from their pocket. It costs $50 to manufacture one barrel of oil with the workers and the boats and the energy and to get it out of the land. $50 is your cost. Everything above 50, it's net profit. Right now it's $82 a barrel. That means they sell millions of barrels every day. On each barrel they make $32 right now, the Arabs. So what did they do? They made the oil so, ch so cheap that the Americans stopped. So it's not worth it. It will cost us $50 to make a barrel of oil from the, from the rocks. If we can get it from Saudi for 10, why would we invest trillions of dollars into the manufacturing of this new technology when, uh, when we can get very cheap oil? So they lower the prices. When the Americans say, okay, we let, we let it go, their price went back. Once the price went back, the Americans went back to do it. Now, they are becoming slowly, slowly independent. Israel is also doing it. Soon comes the time that the world won't need the oil of the Arabs. What will the Arabs have to offer in the world? What will they have to offer? Right now what kept them uh, around and in power is only the oil. Take away the oil, they do not contribute anything but bad to the world. It's nothing positive. Just terror and killing and murdering and uh, terrible ideology. Everybody lives in fear around. Take away the oil, that's it. Who's going to give all the money to the Palestinian to murder people? They're not going to have all this money. And when they're going to become poor, these countries, that means their citizens will be bitter. All these kings will be slaughtered one by one. Give it 20 years, you see what's going to be their end. If Mashiach doesn't come before, if Mashiach comes, we don't need all this. But what I'm saying to you is that it's all in the end of Hashem. If he wants the Arabs to have wealth, there's nothing you can do about it. Do you know, I once saw a video 30 years ago of someone who invented a car that drives on water. He shows you the car drives full speed. No pollution, no nothing. Water. It doesn't cost you a dollar a week. 
All week you drive non-stop. On water, where is the car and where is the guy? The guy disappeared and all the technology of the car disappeared. Who killed him? I leave it to you to decide. The fact is that 30 years later you still pay in Los Angeles more than $6 a gallon. <laughs> $6 a gallon. Here in the United States you pay so much. In Israel, wow, forget it. It could have been a wonderful world. You drive as much as you want, all machinery, airplanes, everything runs on water. You know how much a flight would be? 50 bucks from here to Israel. 100, 200 in the summertime. Right now, when they raise the prices of oil, right away, $300, the ticket goes higher. It's all depend on the price. It burns a lot of oil, an airplane. But it's not only the oil that the airplanes burns. It's to make the airplane you need oil. The factories, the machines, the freights, everything is oil. You pay uh, today to send one fill-in from, uh, from New York to Europe, it's almost $200. Not overnight. Regular shipping, a week, two weeks. Almost $200 to send two pounds. I don't know, it's, it's less than two pounds. Imagine if I want to send this bottle of water, which costs, I don't know, two, three dollars. If I want to send it now to London, it will cost me $180 to ship this with UPS, this bottle. One of the reasons is the oil prices. It will be a whole different world, but the blessing that Ishmael got did not end yet. They still have their they're relevant only thanks to the oil. Remember, they never invented any technology. They did not invent any medicine. They do not contribute at all to the world. Just they have oil, that's it. If United States will have oil on, of their own, and Israel and many other countries with this uh, shell uh, oil, the, no, nobody would need their oil. Iran, no matter how much they put a ban on them, who buy oil from Iran? China, other, North Korea, all these evil countries. So they give business to Iran. They get a very special low price. But that keeps the Iranian going. But all of what's happening right now in the end, it's all Hashem. We don't need United States, we don't need anyone. Hashem can make the Israelis invent things that the whole world will beg for it. Israel has, uh, you know, a lot of ideas and a lot of developments. So you don't want Israel, you hate Israel. Israel will be isolated. The Israelis can develop their own missiles. They can make their own bombs. I don't know why they're buying it from United States. Here, now they... The Canada just said, no more weapon. We don't sell weapon to Israel. In the middle of the war, just like Hussein Obama. I don't understand. Why the Israelis did not make their own weapon? What do you need them for? We can we give a lot of jobs to Israelis. There's many people who don't have parnasa. Make factories in Israel, and you sell to the world bombs and weapons. You sell guns. You sell many other things. Now you have the laser gun. You sell the Iron Dome. There is a lot of Israeli weapon in the world. What's the problem to make a bomb? It's the easiest things to do. But they pay fortune to buy it from the United States. What for? I don't get it. It will be a quarter of a price if you make it in Israel. 100,000 Israelis will be very happy to have a job in a nice factory. Intel, AMD, Microsoft, Apple, all of them are in Israel. All the inventions in the world come from Israel. The Chinese passed a law today, no more Intel and AMD in China. That's it. Until now, every laptop in the world, they had either Intel or AMD. Now, it's the Chinese is going into the next war in, with the United States. We don't want any American uh, products here. That's why their stocks went down a lot today. Why? They just lost a big share of the market. 2 billion Chinese. I would assume that at least a quarter of them have a computer. Every year or two they need a new laptop. 
what happened? That's it, the Americans lost the business. This is all Hashem, Rabotai. It's all Hashem moving as He wants. Just we need emuna and to be tzaddikim. That's it, we don't need America, we don't need Russia. Let them kill each other, it's not our business. We have to be attached to Hashem. And not counting on all kinds of anti-Semites people. Today you have a nice president, tomorrow an evil one comes in. We cannot count on them. It's written clearly, Am levadad ishkon uvagoim lo itchashav. The destiny of the Jewish people is to be isolated, to be alone, to be aided, to be on a ban. And I should be proud of it, I should be happy of it. They shouldn't feel bad that the world hates us. Better. We should stay with us together, united. We don't need to mix with the rest of the world. And we don't need their favors. We only need Hashem. What's better? The United States will be our back? Or Hashem? Who do you want to count on? On Biden? On transgender in his government? All these Rishayim Arurim? Or you want to count on Hashem? By the way, you should know the concept. When you count on evil, wicked people, you lose the siyata dishmaya from Hashem. You're not going to get both. You either count on the Americans, I put you in the hand of the Americans. You count on me, you are in my hand. It's much better for you. So, Rabotai, it's written in Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 19. Ve'aya... בהניח השם אלוקיך לך מכל אויביך מסביב בארץ אשר השם אלוקיך נותן לך נחלה לרשתה Translation As Hashem give you relief from all your enemies that surround your land that God gave you to inherit meaning the land of Israel that's when you're going to have the energy, the strength to erase the memory of Amalek. Timche et zecher Amalek mitachat ha-shamayim lo tishkach. Make sure that under every place in the world, under the sky, no one will ever remember who is Amalek. And remember, we're not talking biologically, the children of Amman and the Nazis, no. Their ideology, the kfira, the heresy. We're going to get rid of the heresy from the world. Clean it. Mipnei shesham mitgaber beyoter klipat amalek in the land of Israel. That's when they have the biggest effect. Especially before the arrival of Mashiach, which is our generation. We are very close to the arrival of the Mashiach. Samuch meot lebiyat Mashiach tzitkenu. Koach amalek mitchazek beyoter. מפני שהשטן יודע, the Satan knows, that very soon Hashem will purify the world and there's not going to be no evil left. That's when he puts most of his efforts to get as much as he can before the end. And how the Satan achieve his biggest achievement when he separate between the Jews and the Torah. That's the bottom line. When Jews connected to Torah, they are different people. Once they leave the Torah, they're busy with business, with politics, with this, with wars, lots of different things. Once they're not connected to Torah, all the problems come. Kol am kabel al atzmo al Torah, ma'avirim imen ol derech eretz, Chazal say. There is a rule. Everyone who accepts on himself the weight of the Torah, meaning the efforts to learn Torah, put all your energy into it. Hashem remove away from you the weight of any other burden in life. Doctors, hospitals, courts, fighting, business, competition, going to war, killing yourself. As you can see now, the war against the yeshivot in Israel now is in the highest it's ever been. And it's unbelievable because it comes by waves. And who does it? The lefty liberal medias, the heart of Amalek. 
they instigate, they make all the foolish Israeli, go to work, why do we need you to learn Torah? Every time they attack the Bachurei Yeshivot, tragedies come one after the other. What happened with America today? And now, the Hamas got a huge relief today. Wow, we don't have to release the prisoners. The whole world is putting pressure on Israel to stop attacking us. We can keep these hostages and kill them, and we can just put them in a, in a cage forever. No rush. The world turned to our, our side. Six months later, everyone forgot everything. Who does it? Hashem. I told people in the first week, so wow, the whole world is united behind us. Give it a month or two, you'll see. Wow, come on, oh, this time is different. People have short memory. One to two months, no one will remember. Now, half of the goyim already say that it's fake, it never happened. Even here in America, you have fools that say there was no September 11. It was a conspiracy theory. Or that the United States government did it. You saw what happened now in Russia? Oh, about 150 Russians, women, children, people went to a theater. ISIS goes in, shoot them, kill them. So, now the Russians are trying to take advantage on this tragedy to say that uh, Ukraine did it. Or at least Ukraine supported them by letting them in or letting them run, or whatever the case is. Most likely they lie, but it's good for their political agenda. Who does all of that? It's all Hashem. Why would Hashem send a bunch of terrorists to shoot at Russia? Russia is the number one supporter of all Muslim evil. Without Russia, they couldn't do 1% of the murders that they do in the world. All their weapons come from Russia. All the support, the backup of Iran is Russia. Russia and China now are the evil of the world. They support the terrorists. They did not condemn October 7. They support the Hamas. Hamas went to meet with them a few times. They accepted them like some kind of kings. Russia is the reason for all the terrorism, all the Muslim terrorism. Why ISIS wants to kill Russians? Should kiss their feet. You know why? I'll tell you why. Because Hashem had had an urge to let the Russian taste from their own food. What does it mean? Everything Hashem does is measure for measure. Mida keneged mida. They don't have a problem that they murder 1,500 innocent Israelis, right? They don't have a problem. They make fun at the Israelis. Where were your army? Where were your intelligence? You claim to be Israel is Finnish. They made fun all over in Russian news. They made fun. What did Hashem do? Exact same thing he did to them. Smaller, but the same idea. Where was your intelligence? Where, where is the KGB? Where is all the, the spies, the, the people, that, uh, the, the police? Nobody showed up. Two, three hours, no one showed up. They're going and shooting and killing people and burning the place, and nobody went in. So that's one mida keneged mida. You laugh at Israel, you get the same thing. But, but, why the Muslims from all the countries in the world will attack the one who helped them the most in the history? The heart of Amalek is those Russia. The answer is because all Hashem needs is to take one crazy fanatic murderer Muslim turn something in his stupid head, and he's going like a monster. We have to kill that Russians. What did Hashem, how did Hashem do it? He gave them an idea that the Russians support Assad in, in Syria. And Assad, together with some other countries, fought against ISIS. ISIS were occupying territories. They lost their territories because Assad is supporting Assad. So they don't care that he helps the Hamas. They don't care that he helps the Jihad. They don't care that he helps all the other terror organizations and give them weapons and support and bring them into his country and sit with them with such respect. 
Hashem drove them crazy. But he helped us to kill ISIS. We have to show them. We instigate between them. Now they're going to attack ISIS and Ukraine. Why Hashem want them to attack Ukraine? What Ukraine did to deserve such a disaster? Two years already, the country is destroyed. And probably after this attack, oof, what's waiting for them? Who knows? He can end in a nuclear bomb. I won't be surprised at all. If you wake up one night, one morning, and you hear that they wipe out some city there with, with nuclear, they're already talking about it. Yes. Openly. They already armed the nuclear bombs. So it's just a matter of a decision. Another attack like this, 10,000 Russians will die, they'll blow up some gas place, you hear 10,000 Russians are dead, choking in the street, a minute later they dump a nuclear on Kiev. And then, the, then Gog and Magog will start full time. It can happen any minute. Why does Hashem punish the Ukrainians so much? They murdered two million Jews. And they did it with such pleasure. In the Holocaust, they killed even those that the Nazis didn't tell them to kill. They rushed to kill. But you know what's the difference between them and other countries who cooperated with the Nazis? That other countries, after the war, they hid. They hid their cooperation with the Nazis. They destroyed statues. They removed things from the books. They are not proud of the fact that they helped to murder millions of people. Except the Ukrainians. They are proud of all their murderers. Everywhere you go, you see their statues, streets on their name. People that murder hundreds of thousands of people are big heroes in Ukraine. Yes. They never actually repented even a bit. So what does Hashem do? We'll hit them nonstop. Until maybe somebody there would think, why is God doing it to us? What, what, what have we done? And someone will get up and say, oh, maybe it's because what we did to the children of God. We murdered two million of them. Maybe Hashem won't rest until he will kill at least two million of us. You know what, in life, yeah, when, a, when a person doesn't want to give a get to his wife, he doesn't want to give her a get. He wants to destroy her life. He's evil. Revenge. He wants to take revenge. So what happens? They bring him to bed din and they beat him up. That's what they used to do in the old days. Today they, they, it's illegal. They will arrest the bed din. Then the lefty liberals will come and say, ah, the religion is chauvinist. <laughs> Women have no rights. She has to sit 10 years in her home because her dirty husband doesn't want to give her a get. It's all your religion. No, you fool. It's your fault that she didn't get a get. Because you don't let us get her the get. The Torah says I had to get a get from that monster husband. But you don't let. You put handcuffs on our hand, we cannot beat him up. If we beat him up, we're going to go to jail. So no rabbi wants to do it. That's why she sits home for 10 years and suffered. So you tie our hand and then come and say, look at this guy. He did not do anything to help this miserable woman. Of course I didn't. You tie me to a pole with handcuffs. How am I going to help her? That's how they are. I'm a leg. Crooks. So what happened? They used to take the men to the bed in and ask him, will you give her a get? No. Pah. Oh. Will you give her a get? No. Pah. Let's say after 30 shots, he said, okay, okay, I'll give her a get. You little fool. Now you have scars all over you. For life. <laughs> In the end, you gave the gate. Why didn't you give it after one shot? That's what happened to the Ukrainians. They could have learned right away and say, God, we're very sorry for what we have done. Help us. Let us make it up to, the, to your children that we murder with such cruelty. Maybe Hashem will cancel the whole thing. Because once you repent, the end of our omit b'fnei tshuva. Well, what did they do? No, they want to learn the hard way. Remember what they say in the Israeli army? Ma! Shelo ba derech harosh, ba derech haraglaim. What doesn't come through the head will come through the legs. 
Meaning, you don't want to understand when I talk to you? No problem. You will learn the hard way. Same thing with Israel. You attack the yeshivot. You attack the religious people. You attack the rabbis. Non-stop propaganda. You going to learn the hard way. Boom, October 7. October 7, everybody mentally destroyed until now. It worked for three, four months. The evil, secular, lefty haters of Hashem and his Torah, they eased their hatred a little bit and their speeches against the yeshivot. And what happened now? They went back to do it full force, which leads me to believe that the next tragedy will be a lot bigger, a lot bigger. What doesn't come through the head, comes through the legs. And by the way, something terrible will happen in the United States as well. Why? I'm not a prophet and definitely don't have Ruach HaKodesh. But I learned from history. Every time the United States voted against Israel in the United Nations or did something dirty like they did today, a natural disaster came to America. Remember the New Orleans flood? One person made in YouTube a video, some Christian, speaking against Hussein Obama, the fool. Say, so you brought it on us. Every time you turn your back to our Israeli friends, to the children of God in the Holy Land, Hashem, God, punished us immediately with a disaster. Some Christians that follow religion, they have at least eyes to see the hand of Hashem in a creation. Other people, they live like animals. Animals don't think it's Ashgacha of Hashem. They eat, all they want to do is to eat and have babies. That's all. Can't think out of the box, the animals. Some people are like animals. But people that believe in God, they see supervision every second, every second in their life. Every second. You say the evangelists are good people? Who? No, I didn't say that. Don't get the wrong conclusion. I just say that people that believe in God, they believe in another God, but they believe in that God, they know that what something happened in the world comes from him. Other people? Ah, nature. Coincidence. New Orleans. Earthquake. Tsunami. Natural disaster. How many people in the world say that natural disaster come because of abomination? It's written in the book of God that when people behave like animals, Hashem will destroy the world like it happened in Sodom and Gomorrah and in the flood and the Babylonian tower. It happened a few times. Places of idol worshipping. That are the places that are in the highest risk of natural disaster. Abomination, meaning homosexuality, and idol worshipping. Places that people break Shabbat, Chilul Shabbat, it brings fire. Lots of tragedies with fire. This one burned, that one burned, this building burned. All kinds of burning. Makom sheyesh bo chilul Shabbat de Gemara say, metsuya bo adleka. Adleka. Abotai, I just want to finish. We have two minutes left. We started, Baruch Hashem, Sefer Vaikra. The entire Sefer Vaikra is ten chapters. Esar Parashot, ten. And the entire period that it took in history is only one month. That's it. And it's called, Chazal called the book, Torah Kohanim, the Torahs of the Kohanim. Kohanim means high priest. The children of Aaron the Kohen, from the tribe of Levi. Tribe of Levi, Moshe and Aaron, were from the tribe of Levi. Right? Their father was Amram, who comes from the family of Levi, Shevet Levi. At, the, at one point, they were split to two families, Kohanim and Levim. Kohen became Aaron and all his children. 
and Moshe and all his children became the Leviim. Leviim and Kohanim are the servants of holiness. They serve in the house of God. They have rights. They get the 10% from people income, from the vegetables, from the fruits, from the animals. They have all kinds of benefits. Why? Because God made a rule. When you are a messenger of God, the community has to take care of your needs. I don't expect you to have both. All day you're going to take care of the people, all day you run the yeshiva, all day you teach, and then you have to go and work another eight, nine hours to make a living. No, it's not realistic. Just like when you send soldiers to the war, you have to give them what they need. You got to give them food, you have to give them a place to sleep, food, drink, medicine, doctors, whatever they need, blankets. Ah, let them take care of their own. What do you mean? They come, they will go to war to protect you. It's your obligation to participate in the expenses. Same thing over here. Hashem said, the Kohanim and the Leviim, they are in Bet HaMikdash, the nation of Israel, have to support them financially. Give them wheat and barley and fruits and all, Truma, Maser, Maser Levi. Also to the poor people. Poor people, the fourth year, Maser Ani, got to give it to the poor people. Bottom line, the Torah took care of all people that needed support. Widows, orphans, converts. There are people who need more help than other people. The Torah took care of everyone. The problem is that the people mess it up, not the Torah. The Torah says what needs to be done. Some people, Hashem gives them a huge blessing, but they don't give 10% from their income. They don't give maser. They're too cheap, too greedy. They don't know that if Hashem gave you a million dollars this year, net profit, and you didn't give a hundred thousand dollars minimum, minimum a hundred, it should be more, but minimum a hundred, you actually stole from God. Meaning he attached to your salary extra 10% to distribute to others. And you kept it for yourself. What is it like? I have a worker. He worked for me in my house. Painter. Let's say painter. He paints and I pay him every day. 200, 200, 200. Finish the job, I give him all the rest. Then I say to him, you're going back to your hometown. There is a guy over there, a poor guy named Moshe. Here, I want you to give him this thousand dollars when you get there, okay? What does he do? He attached the thousand to his salary and he doesn't give it away. Someone like that is a thief or no? Absolutely. Very big thief. Those are the people that Hashem gives them and he expects them to distribute 10% from their net income and they don't do it. They just keep the money. What happened in the end? He takes it away from them. He waits a few years. Once they don't give, one shot psh, made of come and take everything. But it's not like that. I'll give you an example. Let's say Hashem give you every year a million dollars. And you never gave 10%. Never. You give a little bit here and there, but you didn't give your obligation. So what happened? Seven years, you got seven million dollars. You were supposed to give 700,000, but you didn't give. So how much Hashem should take from you? 700,000, no. He takes from you 90% and leave you the 10% you stole. Where is it written? In the verse with the shepherds that Lot and Abraham had a fight. Lot was a greedy man. He knew he has only one relative, which is Abraham, his uncle. He's very rich. If Abraham goes on his journey, as Hashem told him, Lech Lecha, when he was 75, Hashem told him, leave the place and go to the place I will show you. Lord knew that if he won't attach himself to Abraham, when Abraham will die, all his wealth will go to strangers. So he had to follow him to hope that something will happen to him and he is the nephew, he will take everything. At one point, the shepherds of Lot started to fight with the shepherds of Abraham. The shepherds of Abraham told them, why you let your sheep eat from stolen grass? They're going to private property and they eat the grass that belongs to people. It belongs, it's their land. It's not, it's not the mountains that it's healthcare. They can do whatever you want. This is private property. 
So they said, anyway, God promised the land to Abraham. One day it's all going to be his. And our master, Lord, is going to inherit Abraham because he doesn't have his own children. So technically, it's already belonged to us. You know what it's like? There is a couple, old couple, in their 80s. They say to someone, look, we don't have children. We wrote a will that when we die, everything we have will belong to you. You helped us, you're good men. We want you to say Kaddish on us when we die, to teach Torah. So when we die, who's going to help our souls when we're going to need it? We count on you to do it. No problem. So what happened? This guy said, well, they are already going to die in a year or two anyway. They're very old. So he began to use their credit card without permission. They gave him a credit card. They say, you can charge $100 a month donation. What does he do? Go shopping. Ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000. Then uh, someone comes and says to him, hey, what are you doing? That's not your card. It's permitted, don't worry. What do you mean it's permitted? Anyway, they're going to die, and they already wrote in a will that after they die, everything they have belongs to me. So what's the difference now or another two years? Anyway, this money will be mine. Will be, but not right now. It's 100% stealing. Even an hour before they died, if you touched it, you're a thief. There's no such thing. Oh, um, anyway, I'm the only son of my father, so one thing, everything will be mine. So I have permission to use money without permission. It's not working this way. So they started to have a fight. Abraham saw that, and he said, you know what, Lot? Take sheep, take camels, take whatever you need. I want you to be wealthy. Choose where you want to go. Let's separate. Better to separate and stay friends than to be together in a war. That's, by the way, the answer to all the couples that are married and abuse each other. Better to get divorced and not to mess up your children with your fights and your ugly behavior. If you don't know how to be a human being, get divorced. Stay friends from far. Move far away from each other. Why? Like this, there's no war. There's no love, but there is no actual war. Stay in the same house and keep abusing each other and cursing and 911, the police is killing me, he's threatening me. Like two morons in the kindergarten. Big Hilul Hashem, destroying the children, make them a trauma for life. Better to stay far and be in a ceasefire than to be close and have fights. If you can be close without fights, better to be close without fights. But if you can't, stay far away, even from your own parents, from your own divorcee. Even father and son, if when they are together they fight each other, better they be far away. Better to speak as less as possible. As less as possible. What do you mean? Is my father? No, but every time you talk to him, you fight. Better not to talk. Hashem hates fights. Same thing we learned from Abraham. He see fights, he said to Lord, take, take wealth. Take whatever you want. Here, you're wealthy for life. You don't need to wait for me to die. Take it and, you know, move. Move far away. Lot, of course, chose the green side. Why? Green side means more money. The sheep will become fat. They have what to eat. And this is the words of Abraham, and we finish here. Abraham said to Lot, Im tasmil, aimina. Im taimin, asmila. If you go left, I go right. If you go right, I go left. I give you the first choice. Choose. The Gaon Mivilna said, this is the secret of Maser. How do you write Maser, ma'am? Ayn, Shin, and Resh. Mem, Ayn, Shin, and Resh. Maser means give 10% as you obligated. If you put the dot on the left side of the Shin, it's Maser. You give 10% by putting the dot on the left. Hashem say, I will move the dot to the right and make you wealthy. Maser. You put it on the left, I will move it to the right for you. Meaning, once you move the dot 
from the left side of the shin to the right side of the shin, it becomes measher. I will make you wealthy. If you want to take care of yourself, you don't count on me. You want to put the dot on the right, make yourself wealthy by stealing the 10%. I will move the dot from the right to the left. I would leave you 10% and take 90%. Not right away. It may take 20 years. You accumulate. And boom, one shot, and it's all gone. All of a sudden, your son will call you one night from Manhattan. Ah, oh, Dad, don't ask what happened. I drank a little bit too much. I just hit someone drunk on the street. Some homeless. He's dead. I'm getting arrested now. Get me a lawyer. Oh, millions of dollars went to the garbage. Lawsuit. Take away all your property. The insurance won't cover that. How much they cover? Three hundred thousand. They sue you for 70, 80 million dollars. <laughs> My uncle became a millionaire thanks to this. His brother opened the best pizza shop in Israel. Perhaps in the whole world. In Israel. Unbelievable pizza. People from all over the world come to eat pizza by them. That's how great they are. They win every award. Every award. So his brother opened the pizza shop with a karate guy. This karate guy was, uh, you know, Sansei, like Benji. Sansei. This Sansei had the idea to open the pizza shop. He went to Rimini, and there used to be a guy, Manfred Katz, he was the one that owned the, the, the Rimini, he had the, the, the exclusive, this Rimini from Italy. And he got, you know, franchise to open one like that. And a week, after they finished to renovate the place, he hit someone with a car. And that someone was in very bad condition, and right away the, the lawyer called him up, we're suing you for millions, and he already knew that by the time the lawsuit will end, they're gonna take away his share from the pizza shop. So immediately overnight he sold it to my uncle. So now two brothers became partners. He bought it for peanuts and made maybe more than a hundred million dollars over this pizza shop by now. How did it go to him? The guy hit someone. <laughs> Poor guy. I, I'm thinking to myself, he sits there in the city and see the line all the way from here across the street, morning, evening, afternoon, night, non-stop lines, orders, boxes from here to the ceiling, one box of one pie after the other. Tack, one, two, 20 people working by the oven, by the counter. He sits over there when he's basically broke now and think all of that should have been mine. Why did I have to eat that guy? You understand why? Hashem decided that you're not going to make the wealth for whatever reason. This is how it works. You gain, you gain, you gain. Then comes the cloth and clean everything. So how do you prevent it? You give. You give a lot, not only on pouring. You give all the time. Some people have a list. Every deal they close, immediately put 10% in a separate account. Right away, they give, they distribute. Kiruv, yeshiva, poor guy, this, that. When you live like this, you're very lucky. Why? Because you do what Hashem told you to do. At least you don't steal from him. You want to be a thief from Hashem? <laughs> to be a thief from a stranger, it's a disaster. To steal from a non-Jew, it's a disaster. It's against the Torah. To steal from your brother Jew, it's even worse. Your own brother is steal from him? To steal from God, what else can we say? There's so many people don't care about giving maser, they don't give. They don't give, they don't, they don't write. They don't calculate how much they have to give. They don't even know. They give here and there and that's it. They don't fulfill their obligation. On the other hand, you have people that give 20%. That's the real obligation. Chomesh, the Gaon Nivilna says. In order for you to have a guarantee to become very wealthy, 20% from the net income. Chomesh. Count on Hashem. Well, 20%? Yes, 20%. It's good because here in America, if you give 20%, you only have to pay taxes on 80%. Some countries is not like that. 
Some countries, it's count like partial deduction, not the whole thing. Partial deduction they allow you. Here, Baruch Hashem, thanks to Yosef Atzadik, they adapted this law that you don't, you let people give charity and, there, and it's tax exempt, tax deductible. Who made that law? Yosef in the Torah. Admat HaKohanim, they don't have to pay taxes. People that are busy with religion, they have dismissal from paying taxes and from other obligation. This is only the Torah. Kohanim, Levim, this is what Sefer Vaikra is all about. Ten chapters, all the laws of the Kohanim, all the Masrot, all the Trumot, all the Korbanot, everything that talks about what happened in the Mishkan is this. How long did it take? One month. One month, that's it. You teach the whole thing. That's why they call it Torah Kohanim. Bezrat Hashem, next, uh, next Monday there's no lecture, don't forget, no shiur here. Bezrat Hashem, uh, maybe tomorrow I'm going to have more time to go into the subjects of the parasha. <laughs> we'll see by tomorrow. Baruch Adonai Le'olam. Amen ve'amen.